It's really great to be here and especially follow the previous talk. It's very aligned, very great. So, uh, um, so today, let's together to uh, revisit uh, one of the most famous uh, rules in computer system, the Jim Gray's uh, five minutes rule. And let's explore how uh, we, this rule should be redefined in modern days. So uh, back in 1985, uh, Jim Gray formulated this uh, five minutes rule. This is very simple, just like uh, for one K byte page, if the, that page is accessed every five minutes or shorter, we should keep that in memory. So the intuition is very simple. We just uh, compare the cost of a renting memory against of accessing disk. So over the decades, the multiple revisits keep kind of reaffirming this as uh, the same conclusion, like a five minutes rule. So then as a result, the SSD just stay at the storage tier. It is very rarely used to host the active working set. So why revisit again? Um, the multiple reasons, like the original, form, original form formula um, make some assumptions that are no longer valid, and also they re just rely on the uh, on vendor specs in missing a broader design space. And more importantly, the landscape changed. Today, we're at like a throughput-centric AI that is led by NVIDIA. And uh, also, the performance gap between the SSD and the DRAM dramatically reduced. T taken together, that, uh, uh, the, this decades-old rule need a principled update. So this slide shows the, our key findings. That, uh, Using this, what we call the first principle uh, kind of a reformulation, we show that the break even interval actually collapsed from a minute to a second. So that fundamentally sh shift and then reshape the hierarchy. The SSD is no longer a second, second class citizen, it is, should be promoted to the first class citizen. And at the same time, the GPU should be in the center of the uh, I.O. Uh, like I.O. engine. And uh, then uh, practically, we can achieve the same throughput with much less DRAM. So what that means to us, so basically with less DRAM, we have lower cost and the lower power, and the data movement should be managed by the GPU, not CPU. And uh, the SSD behave more like memory. So then it's hosting the active working set so in short, NAND should become a first class in AI. Uh, our approach go back to the first principle. And so then we derive this uh, break-even interval uh, using this, uh, device modeling. So here we take a very simplified system architecture and to account the cost from the host C processor, host DRAM, and SSD in a more like a unified model. And so that changed how we formulate things. So here, let's say, for any data block, that if we decide to cache the data block in DRAM, then we can formulate the cost of renting, as shown there in the, in the top. But if we do not, if we decide not caching the data in DRAM, so suppose the data is accessed every, let's say, like a tall interval seconds, then we need to pay, like, uh, pay as we go through this, we call, we call that a moving cost. So the break even is really reached when the moving cost equals to the uh, renting cost. So given this uh, break even, like uh, for any data that is accessed more frequently than the, this uh, break even, we should keep that in DRAM. Otherwise, we just leave them on SSD. That's it, it's a very simple formulation. So then we plug in some representative numbers here and then we can sh see this very interesting information. Um, here, we, we consider two different types of SSDs. First is just like a normal SSD, just like what we have today. And the IOPS really kind of doesn't change, remain the same, no matter if it's a 4K byte, 2K byte, or 1K byte. And also, we considered another kind of emerging, like a new breed of SSD is really kind of driven by NVIDIA about what we call the storage next SSD. 
the one nice feature about the, the storage next SSD is really tailored for AI. So the, uh, the IOPS can improve as we reduce the block size from 4K byte, 2K byte, 1K byte. So then at the half K byte, we expect that uh, the IOPS per drive can be over 50 million. So here we consider three different platforms like uh, CPU plus DDR, GPU plus GDDR, GPU plus HBM. And each bar here shows the contribution of a different component into the total uh, break even interval. And here we assume that it is uh, like a TLC. So a couple simple observations. First, the host cost cannot be ignored, especially the host processor. And also the SSD still dominate the total break even interval. And uh, the storage next really kind of, uh, especially when we combine the GPU, then we can really push the break even into a tenth of a second. So then if we switch from TLC to SLC, then it becomes much more interesting. So we can see here, especially combined with GPU, then for half K byte, the break even reduced from Sec, uh, minutes into just a five second, even below. So compared with the original five minutes rule, now we have at least the 60 times reduction on the break even. So that means we can much more happily use SSD as more like a memory to host the active working set. And uh, also very importantly, the GPU should be in the center to manage the data movement, to manage the IO, not CPU. And so then when we know that we talk about the storage class memory for many years, but actually it turns out we don't need to chase after those uh, exotic new devices the materials. We already have this uh, SLC NAND flash is already qualified for the storage next, uh, st storage class memory. So, but actually the brick even interval is not the whole story. Like uh, for, to fully exploit the performance, then we need to uh, have the enough number of outstanding requests. So then we combine the, um, this uh, uh, queuing theory and the device modeling, and we can show that uh, to, to, to take the full advantage of the bandwidth, we need to have thousands of 10,000 of this outstanding request. So for that, absolutely the GPU is in a much better position to accomplish that. So we are very excited about this result, results. And so then the next, next Vikram will walk through about what is the implication for the AI infrastructure. Yes. Thank you so much, Professor Tong. So the key in information here is that uh, with the emerging new set of devices, we see the uh, frequent movement between the GPU uh, as a GPU expansion of memory is easily feasible to do. Now, the question is what type of workloads will actually matter uh, and whether those workloads have that much of amount of IO capability or not. To understand this, what we did was we categorized uh, the different types of emerging applications that are coming in this space. There are two types of categories, a generation type of generative AI type of workloads and another is the prediction type of uh, workloads. The typical generative AI are heavily driven by core screen data movements uh, and larger transactions. Uh, you can think about it like LLMs, uh, model weight management, and others. Uh, the key feature here is that you're running out of capacities and endurance, so expand more. So that's the thing to think about when it comes to generative AI. When it comes to prediction, uh, these are newer set of workloads like recommended system, uh, the uh, vector databases and others. Over here, the access patterns are more fine-grained as uh, Teyu was speaking earlier too. There is a lot of fine-grained access uh, ability that are needed for these workloads. And they are heavily uh, dependent on small-grained fine-grained IOs and a lot of IO transactions can happen. You can further see it across many other applications here, like the recommended system, the growth of this memory footprint is increasing dramatically uh, in both types of workloads here. And if you categorize uh, across into the total amount of sites per worker, the access granularities are also shown over here and categorize into whether it's in the training regime, inference regime, or uh, predictive AI regime. Let's put all of those down to like understanding how does it mean uh, if you are a, uh, trying to revisit the Jim uh, Gray's uh, rule and understand uh, how should we think about the locality versus the uh, implications. So if you have a strong locality system, 
Uh, and the way to understand this is you have the x and y axis here. The uh, x-axis basically says the data set percentage from 0 to 100%, which basically tells uh, how much of your data is being accessed at a given point of a time. The y-axis tells you the access uh, interval, data access interval. So if your data access interval is very short, that means that you have very high strong locality. Uh, as you can see over here, the uh, point uh, where it's a lot of access over there. In a strong locality system, what you observe is that the storage next uh, SSD uh, kind of reduces about 3x the reduction in the total DRAM capacity uh, when you execute uh, at scale. If you try to look into moderate locality workload, uh, then it's about 6x the reduction in the total DRAM capacity that you can get by moving towards a storage next SSD. And if you have no locality, and if it's a completely sparse and random access pattern, then you, you can almost eliminate the entire DRAM uh, for the storing this entire data set and get that uh, entire saving uh, with the storage next SSD. So what does it mean? Like uh, the earlier presentation, uh, yes, we need uh, to bring a new hierarchy in the system. Compared to the traditional um, kind of like hierarchy that you used to have, we, we need to introduce a new class of memory hierarchy, and we call that as a storage next. We need to enable NAND as a first class um, as a memory extension system. We need a new I.O. engine that is GPU initiated, GPU native. And we should think about uh, enabling lower cost and increase the throughput. Uh, and we can do all of those with the storage next and the kind of things, services that we are doing. To conclude, uh, and also to call for the action over here. We need to revisit, rethink, and redefine the traditional architectures that have been defined. If you look back uh, about uh, 10 years ago, the entire data center used to be driven by CPU. Uh, now the modern data center, the entire footprint is driven by the GPU. So should we, we should ask the question whether we should be going with the same type of software architecture that has been done for the CPU should be, uh, be used, or should we actually rebuild the software architectures that are needed for the GPU? And what are, it, what are its implications uh, from the uh, storage and hardware perspective is extremely important. Apart from that, we should think about can we move from minutes to seconds? Uh, and from the Jim Garrell's uh, uh, rule standpoint of view, uh, we clearly see uh, we moved away from the five minute rule to five second rule. So that is a new uh, articulation that is happening uh, as the landscape is changing. And GPU plus SSD is actually changing the entire hierarchy uh, of the system architecture. So we should revisit and rebuild the systems in a better uh, uh, solution. We welcome you to join our stores next uh, movement. Uh, so uh, pre, uh, reach out to us, uh, contact Sagib, and he can give you more uh, information. Uh, and uh, we can also help providing additional information about what we are thinking and all, and we have been presenting at different uh, places. So please come and join us, share your insights, share your workload, and uh, help us uh, uh, build the system better. We are open to questions. Thank you. Thank you. We do have a few minutes for questions. If you do have a question, if you want to come up to the microphone in the middle of the room. Uh, between the current storage and the new storage and the storage next, is there a change in the file system? Uh, there is no, I mean, in this uh, modulation that we are trying to do, uh, we have not used any file system or any of those. This is a theoretical uh, definition. So we are trying to model based on a theoretical analysis and nothing else. This, so this is not measured. Oh, okay, this is not, so yeah. empirical data still? This is empirical or more, uh, 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 the way which I think about it is theoretical analysis. Yes, yeah. model. Like model, yeah. Model. Yeah. yeah, and and so you do you project that the storage block I/O should trans to should uh, change to 512 bytes instead of the yes A or 16 kilobytes yes, yes. Uh, and is that only driven for AI or is that also driven by other GPU usages as well? Many other GPU cases too. Uh, even though we spoke about primarily on the AI kind of like workloads, we do have like many other workloads that fall under this category. Uh, I mean, uh, not limited to just uh, like graph analytics or others that are like databases, relational AI, and others that also fall into this category. So, oh, but those are driven by whatever the CPU processing and GPU assisting. Now, if we are reimagining that. Sure. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Uh, Wi-Fi 12. Why not 64 bytes? Ah, great question. <laughs> uh, uh, I think flash windows would uh, uh, come and hunt us down if we ask 64 <laughs> bytes. <laughs> yeah, certainly nothing is impossible. I, I can come on that. The, yeah. the NVMe protocol is 64 byte uh, submission queue, so you have 100% <laughs> overhead. Uh, overhead, so it yeah. makes no sense. So, yeah, but still not impossible. Yeah. 
but you still need to think <laughs> on the lower head, you know, yeah. Um, I mean, the 512 byte, uh, you know, the, the block size from 4K. Now that's going to cause so much headache for the SSD guys because the indirection unit size goes down. Absolutely. Uh, the lookup table is going to go in gigabytes of DRAM. Yes. So SSDs are going to get so expensive. And the access time, did you model that? Yes. Actually, in our work is mainly like for the first principles. What, what, what right now, what we want to do is that to to go to the very bottom from the first principle to see what is uh, theoretically possible, like a theoretical limit. And then from the practical point of view, then we really need to push the, not only in, at the scale flux, it is really the whole community about the solid state drive controller vendor. We really invite everybody to come into the game to, shoot, to see how we can push the controller and plus the NAND, NAND flash to see how much we can get close to, sh to close the gap from the okay. theoretical limit. Just ah. like the Shannon limit, right? Like when we have like information theory, communication, and then really yeah. push yeah. towards the so limit. So much bandwidth in the yeah. Uh, yeah, just a note, uh, in the equation, if you observe, we do have the SSD cost model, and we do charge, uh, yes. we, we do increase yeah. the model cost for the storage next SSD. Yeah. Uh, the exact formulation on the uh, ratios, uh, we can share it uh, separately, it is in the backup slide, but yes, we do model, so yeah. yeah. Uh, this person. Uh, it, it seems there's a uh, you know, surging demand of uh, eSSD. Uh, so can you maybe elaborate more? Is there more demand for, for, uh, during the trainings, uh, training uh, of uh, LM or uh, you know, demand from the e inference? And is this like a longer term structural demand or just you know, t t temporary because of you know, a mismatch between supply and demand? Thank you. Uh, good question. So uh, right now, the kinds of applications that we are studying, uh, uh, we clearly see storage next as not the use case for uh, training workloads like uh, LLM training for checkpointing, offloading, or others. Uh, for in the inference, it is debatable. Depends on which type of workload that you're looking into uh, and what type of access pattern that you're looking into. Uh, it is becoming more and more clear uh, if you're trying to do like uh, uh, predictive AI uh, over there, uh, the demand is way more uh, needed towards uh, IOPS per dollar kind of like uh, uh, solution stack. Yeah. Kind of related, I guess, to the indirection table and sort of some of your, oh, if you stayed on that. Oh, this one? Nice, yeah. Uh, some of the sizes you have defined for the different workloads. What do you see for capacities needed per drive? I mean, I think I've heard that they're much smaller capacities, so it may not be as big of a problem for indirection table. Good question. Um, we have not figured out an optimal data point on what is the capacity that is needed, so we are studying that uh, across all the different uh, workloads. Uh, I think we are still early to make a decision and then give a communication about like, hey, this is the best range that we can work with. Uh, I think at the end of the day, it comes down to the trade-offs. Uh, trade-offs like the, what is the useful IOPS, what is the useful endurance, and what, what are the other things that we are to think about. Uh, until we have a better clarity about it, it's too early to make a conclusion. Gotcha, thanks. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? All right, thank you so much. Thank you.